do it. All right, we are starting. We are starting with zero, zero attendees. So this is positive. <laughs> and we're live, right? So everyone can see the video. I, I guess so. Yeah, I'm just seeing audience. Uh, there is, it's not showing up with anyone. I'm sure Kat is going to log on. It's like Kat is blocking other spammers on the page. I hope so. So yeah, they, a couple popped up, but Todd H he's on. <gasps> Todd. All right. Todd is here. There are viewers. It just says zero. All right. Great. We are off to a cracking start today. My um, my heart rate has been elevated for about 60 minutes. I'm not sure what this is doing for my cardiovascular health, if, if this is good or not. Um, but yes, thank you for sticking with us and, and joining us on the new link because we, we, we were trying to get LinkedIn live working for a long time this morning. Hi, Holly. Hi, Jenny. Good to have you here. Hello. We're, we had to get set up a new link. We've got active trolls on the LinkedIn event page as we speak, trying to garner all the traffic over to whatever thing they're trying to get. So <laughs> this is a, unlike any other live event we've done, but yeah. it'll be all good. We got some good stuff to share. So Yep. This is this has been the most exciting live um, webinar I've done in a long time. So uh, usually when when you're kicking off these kind of events, people ask where are you where are you dialing in from. But I have a better question today. Um, share in the chat what is your travel hack now that we're all sort of getting back to traveling and airports. Um, we could all do with a little bit of a refresher. I, I certainly can. So what's your uh, number one travel hack when flying? What a, What's yours, Russ? Um, the one, two combination, some Lysol wipes and uh, and noise canceling AirPods <laughs> for the Good airplane. Point. What about you? Yep. Mine is getting to the airport like three hours early. I'm not a, I'm not a last minute airport kind of person. Um, so I play it real safe. I get into the, I get into the lounge. I get some work done. Um, I judge the people who were there at 10 AM drinking wine in the airport lounge. <laughs> you know, you always see those people and half the time they're wearing a business suit as well. I always, I always wonder about those people. So, oh, Mario, Mario Strano says drinks. Thanks. Well, maybe that is, maybe that is you, Mario. Packing cubes. That's a good one. I haven't got on that. Strategic folding. That's always a tough one. I can, I can rarely arrive wrinkle free. Uh, order go puff from the ride from the airport to the hotel to arrive at the same time. That is a good one. Yes. <clears throat> These are good tips. We should, we could do a, uh, we could do a, uh, a travel hacking webinar next time, <laughs> Russ. I mean, if you ever want to do a webinar with me again. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think that we're good to get started. Um, let me pull up the slides here and we'll jump right in. So um, someone could give me a holler and let, let me know if you can see the slides. Would appreciate that. Um, I can see I them am, on my side. Great. Well, for those of you, thank you, Holly. All right. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kiri Masters from Bobsled. We recently joined Acadia, which is a full service uh, digital growth agency. And I'm joined today by Russ Derringer, from Stradably. Hey, Russ. Hey, Kerry. Looking forward to this one. Yes, me too. So a little bit about Bobsled. We are a digital marketing agency. Um, I founded the company in 2015. And um, today we help brands uh, with their Amazon sales channel, but also Walmart, Instacart and Target advertising as well. 
Today, we're a team of 60 marketplace, uh, retail marketplace professionals. And like I said, recently joined forces with Acadia now as part of a more full service offering there. Yep. And I uh, started Stratably to help elevate the digital IQ inside of big consumer brand organizations. And I do that through a twice weekly newsletter combined with on-site and virtual trainings for really all parts of the organization, including the e-commerce team, senior executive team, and, and all of their teammates. Um, I cover a broad range of topics in my research, including, of course, Amazon, which we'll talk about today, but also topics like retail media, supply chain, online grocery, and so on. Essentially, all of the big topics that are important to a VP of e-commerce or a chief digital officer, for example. So, um, so we'll just get into it. So a big challenge for brands when it came to Amazon, particularly those doing wholesale business with big retailers, was just how different it was from what they were accustomed to. This is an image. Um, it shows Amazon's sort of legendary flywheel, which as an aside, Jeff Bezos developed this in the early days of Amazon after meeting with Jim Collins, where he was introduced to these flywheel concepts. And this flywheel challenged a lot of conventional strategies and tactics at brands. And at the very same time, Amazon was such a small part of the retail market. So it was a marketplace model, which meant there were very low barriers to entry and your competition was different than what you faced inside of a store. And typically there was more competition. P&L was very different because now you were shipping to a home and you know, it's just difficult to get a sub $10 item sold in a store profitable when you, when you have to get it to the house. Um, Amazon's price matching algorithm exposed a brand's distribution and promotional strategy, which created all sorts of headaches across the organization. And even how Amazon conducts and conducted business on the one piece side with a lot of brands is very transactional, which challenged sort of like traditional old school concepts around building long term relationships with experienced merchants, uh, like many brands were accustomed to at the big retailers they did business with. And so these are just a few of the ways that Amazon was fundamentally different than traditional retailers. And early on, it was such a small percentage of sales relative to big competitors that it was unclear why a brand should go all in with Amazon when the model was so different and frankly disruptive to what they were trying to do in other channels. And so it's just a great example of what famed disruptive technology professor Clayton Christensen would describe as a disruptive model that incumbents are slow to adopt, adapt to because of how different it is, meaning Amazon's retail rivals were slow to adopt to it. And even consumer brands uh, were, in many cases, uh, slow to, to adopt. Of course, uh, we now know the power of that flywheel. And this is a, a, one of uh, Stradably's projections. So it, Amazon is on pace to surpass Walmart in the US as the largest retailer. And, this is frankly pretty incredible. There's you know, a lot of talk about return to stores and the decelerating trends in e-commerce because you know, apparently everyone wants to shop inside of a store now that COVID is um, not necessarily past us, but, but uh, we're in a different stage of the pandemic at this point. Um, but this chart should be eye-opening here. Just five years ago, Amazon US was less than half the size of Walmart and now it's on pace to surpass it this year in my model. And so what went from, you know, let's put, Joe, the intern on the Amazon account, and maybe he'll figure it out, or let's put Tracy on it because she's running Costco and she's out in Seattle, has turned into Amazon becoming essentially a top growth priority for consumer brands across essentially every category. Yeah. Turn, turn so, over to Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, it, we, we were thinking about this concept of karate um, as a um, as an allegory for success on Amazon and, and becoming an Amazon black belt. So with traditional karate, there is an emphasis placed on self-development. And before you learn anything around combat or self-defense skills, any of that physical element, um, karate requires developing a proper psychological attitude towards the art. And these psychological attitudes include perseverance, fearlessness, virtue, and leadership skills. And so we believe that every brand can become an Amazon black belt and reach that upper 
echelon of, of success to be skilled and practiced in, in the art. But the, the thing that must come first is this internal psychological profile, um, which we're going to share a little bit more about today. So how we, you know, the context of our discussion today is built around some research that uh, we conducted at Bobsled and uh, I collaborated with Russ on here. We had 108 consumer brands that took our Amazon Savviness score self-assessment. And part of that was um, looking at, we asked, people, we asked those respondents to share what their Amazon growth rate was year over year. And then also to assess from their own perspective how their company was um, was uh, performing across different factors like executive buy-in, the choice of KPIs and um, supply chain prioritization, willingness to test and learn, a whole variety of factors. Um, so then we were able to see based on sort of overperformance or underperformance in those various factors, what did the Amazon uh, performance look like as a result? And so what we did find uh, was that for the brands who are really leaning into all four of those success factors, they were outperforming um, by a, a factor of 16% on, um, on growth there, which is pretty compelling stuff. So we do have, um, you know, we're going to talk at a higher level today about those four internal factors for Amazon success, executive buy-in, matching purpose to KPIs, supply chain prioritization, and a test and learn mindset. But I do really recommend that, um, take, a, take a snapshot of this QR code here. We uh, have the full report, which is a PDF with all of the survey uh, data and charts, much more analysis than what Russ and I are able to get into to today, and more extensive discussion questions to use within your company. So, if you take us, if you use this QR code, you'll get to the download form to get that report, um, and that will also include the um, the slides from today and the replay as well. So, highly recommend you um, sign up for that. Now, so you can see the All right, so Russ, I'll pass it over to you to talk about the, the first factor here. Okay, great. Yeah, so the first factor, and this one is so critical, is executive buy in. So on the next slide. Yep. <clears throat> Let's talk about the chart. So the chart here illustrates the difference in growth on Amazon from brands that describe their organization is having strong executive buy-in around making Amazon a top priority compared to those that categorize their executive team as having more limited buy-in. And sometimes that can mean just one or two executives sort of, you know, really push back on Amazon. And other times it can mean just more unanimous thinking that Amazon's uh, not important. And as you can see in the chart, growth is more than two times for brands that have that executive buy-in. And you know, it's interesting. I've advised a lot of different brands over the years. It was always really easy to understand how they were going to do on e-commerce and, and Amazon in particular, based on the engagement with the executive team. Were the executives in the meeting sort of there because they, they had to be, they were forced to, they needed to check a box, or were they, were they there because they really wanted to figure out Amazon and they were really intrigued by the opportunity. And, and, and um, as a consultant and advisor going in, it, it just was almost immediately clear how the, the, the meeting was going to go um, based on some of the some of that behavior. So, you know, bought in executives, they're doing things like investing ahead of where sales are at today. They're looking at their distribution strategy strategy to see if that's in alignment with Amazon's marketplace and and price matching model, along with the other items I, I list there to give you an idea. So the impact of executive buy-in is really hard to overstate. And, you know, you could be a rock star director of Amazon or director of e-commerce, but ultimately the senior executive ranks, they control the funding and the strategic direction of the business, which really makes all the difference in driving results on Amazon. And so 
we always sort of felt like this was impactful to Amazon and e-commerce businesses, but prior to this study, I had never seen seen it quantified. So I found this factor to be really, really interesting um, from the study. Yeah, I think it, it really lays the foundation for everything else that you could do with the channel here. If, if you don't have a it, your leadership bought into Amazon as a as a strategically important channel, it's going to be really difficult to get anything else done um, between, you know, securing funding for advertising to even, you know, just getting attention on this on this channel um, for, for the company. And just to get a little bit more specific and share an anecdote, when I, I have also spoken with um, some practitioners at that sort of VP of e-commerce or uh, director of director level. And if there's not that kind of buy-in, it's really tough to know how to push things forward. And are you going to be pushing that boulder up a hill with no support there? And I think that that often leads to attrition at that level and good people leaving companies because they're not going to be able to get the job done and that will obviously create a bit of a virtuous cycle with um you know if the executives are not bought in then the the practitioner level might leave or become disengaged and the company again uh sort of spirals out of out of engagement with this channel yep Anything else to add? Anything else to add? No, I was, just, you know, I was just going to add, Kiri, that, yeah. you know, it's a balance, right? Like if you're in e-commerce, a part of your job is to help educate the organization. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if, if um, you know, if you're spending all of your time doing that and trying to convince team, the team and, and executives in this case of just the importance of it, like just as a starting point, it, it it's it's challenging to do really innovative and cool things. And so it's a tough place to find yourself. And I always try to, you know, help when people are thinking about, you know, joining a new firm in, in a, in a director type of role, it, you know, what is the job going to entail? Is it going to be more focused on identifying like the big growth opportunities and how to transform the business? Or is it going to be, you know, trying to convince people mm. that you should be doing that? And it's just a, you know, it's a different way to, to spend your time. And, um, but it, but it really, really matters. I think as the data shows to have that executive buy-in and it's great if, if that can be the starting point, uh, when you take on a new role. Yep. That's a great point. Are you going to be spending half of your time, uh, convincing people that this is a good idea? <laughs> so let's move on to the second factor here, which is matching purpose to KPIs. Um, and this is, I like to talk about this set of scales and balancing this tension between profitability and growth. And I don't think that it's a necessarily a zero sum game. There's no company out there who is going to be willing to lose money to, to acquire customers uh, forever, or certainly the, they wouldn't have the, uh, the financial um, capability to keep doing that forever. And any company focused entirely on profitability and, and maximizing profitability at every turn is soon going to be disrupted from um, more sort of growth oriented brands willing to come in and, and spend more to acquire a customer. But at the end of the day, whether it's at the brand level, at the product subset level, or at the, uh, at the product level, there is a choice to be made. And that is, are we wanting to, uh, do we have a growth objective around growing market share, growing share of voice, growth metrics like that? Or is this a product that is sort of towards the end of the maturity cycle and a cap or a cash cow product or, or a product that we're sort of looking to for uh, maximizing profitability? So that is, you know, at the, end, at the end of the day, two objectives that have some degree of tension between them. Um, and this is something that we've learned at Bobsled over the years is if we're unclear uh, or the client is unclear about what the objective is there, we're always going to be um, chasing our tails in, in terms of 
delivering on um, the an unknown objective. So if I'm looking for growth, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of profitability. I'm going to be looking at top of funnel um, advertising um, strategies, for example, and I'm going to be a little bit less concerned about um, metrics like ROAS, for example. And the inverse is true if we're, we're focused on profitability, we might be looking more towards a ROAS as a, as a metric and less towards share of voice. But I, I just want to bring it back to this tension here and explain um, there is a trade-off to be made and that this is one of the biggest sort of challenges that I see in uh, working with brands is those brands being unclear on what, what their real objective is. And certainly what we found in the survey was a bit of a, a pretty much a 50-50 split between brands who are looking to grow profitability and brands who are looking to grow market share. And there's not, you know, one objective is not necessarily better than the other one. But what did concern us when we looked at um, the, the actual KPIs that brands have chosen is that there is a mismatch here between brands that are uh, you know, looking to grow market share. A lot of them are still focused on ROAS or ACOS as a key metric. And likewise, for most of the brands who are looking to grow, grow profitability, they're also one, looking at one of their key KPIs being revenue growth. And so this concerns me because it sort of shows a, a bit of a muddling between what the objective is and what the KPIs are that you're looking at on your dashboard or reporting up to those executives that you may be, um, you know, wishing to get more aligned with you. Yeah, and Kiri, I just would add, you know, when because of this sort of disconnect between the goals and the KPIs, I think it leaves everyone sort of disappointed. <laughs> yeah. And and although we're talking about Amazon, we'll talk a little bit about test and learn as one of the factors later, but the, you know, this, this challenge of like, what is the purpose of Amazon? You see the same thing happening right now in other areas, like retail media is an example. And some mm. of these metrics tie very much into advertising, but Retail media, one of the biggest challenges that brands have with retail media is they don't know what KPIs to track and pay attention to because they don't necessarily have clarity as to what purpose retail media serves. So at Amazon, I always try to think of Amazon as think of all the challenges that Amazon has presented and can we use that at, um, in a way to new areas that are important to to e-commerce. So this is one where, you know, I think retail media is very much in the early stages of like, what's the purpose of this and and what are the KPIs? But even here with Amazon, you know, several years into it, um, there's still sort of a challenge around aligning the the goals with the with the metrics. Yeah. And and to give a more specific example, you know, as an as an agency, sometimes we're asked can you achieve, can you get us a ROAS of eight or nine on 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 Amazon? And um, and any agency that you ask that question is going to say yes, but the the actual path to get there may leave you disappointed because you know we can get a ROAS of eight, nine, ten if we're focused on long tail branded keywords only, which might have a very limited audience. Uh, and if your objective is to actually grow sales of that product or, or for the brand overall, you know, focusing in on a really high ROAS is going to end up sort of um, killing, killing that opportunity to reach more customers. So it's just, a, again, that natural tension is really important to be aware of. And I'd, I'd also share that with, you mentioned, retail media networks, Russ, they all have their chosen metrics that they put in front of you on a dashboard. And, and a lot of them are, are similar between dashboards. So ROAS is, is one that is just 
everyone expects it to be there so it's there and it gets reported up and it's just a metric that's quite easy to compare across different networks so it becomes a default um default kpi even if that's not really what the focus should should be on um and i'm, I'm sure everyone's heard of that phrase what gets measured gets managed or what gets measured gets done and i would just again uh suggest be very careful about what you're measuring and reporting on because uh if it if it does not really align with the objectives of that product or brand um then you're going to end up uh subconsciously at least sending a message that this is important and we need to improve that number when in fact improving that number might go against your ultimate objective. All right, well, let's move on to the, the third factor. Okay, so supply chain prioritization, incredibly important when it comes to e-commerce generally and Amazon specifically. Um, so from the perspective of Amazon itself, supply chain and the ability to deliver items quickly and reliably has just been a fundamental game changer, particularly for its Prime membership program. The Prime program has a ton of different benefits, sort of like a laundry list of, of stuff. But Amazon knows the big driver is free delivery. And so that's what it highlights as a top benefit on their Prime page, which is what the, the magnifying glass uh, illustrates. Amazon has the biggest distribution network. Uh, it's out of Walmart and even Shopify, uh, the D2C giant, they want to create their own fulfillment network. It's planning to invest only 6% of what Amazon has already invested to help its merchants deliver to end consumers. So Amazon stands alone completely from a supply chain capability um, when it comes to delivery to the home. But that doesn't mean that it's easy for brands to take advantage of. So on the next slide, yep. like executive buy-in that I talked about earlier, supply chain prioritization of Amazon has a tremendous impact on performance. And I think the results were pretty encouraging here. Nearly three quarters of brands polled indicate they do, in fact, prioritize Amazon in their supply chain operations. And for those that did, they grew 48% compared to 29% uh, for those mm. that didn't. You know, things like adjusting to smaller order sizes than what a retailer like Walmart might order because of the way goods flow through Amazon's network. Chargebacks and deductions are a major challenge that can require uh, incremental investment or changing certain processes and the speed of information flow through the supply chain. Uh, for 3P sellers, changing limitations on inventory levels can disrupt operations. So Amazon is just a, is just a very highly dynamic account when it comes to supply chain. But mm -hmm. for those brands that can make it a priority to be excellent at, the results back it up. Yep, definitely. And I, I can share from our experience, particularly in 2021, where uh, actually, Russ, you, you made a really great comment here, which which I've repeated a number of times, which is 2021 was all about getting inventory onto the shelves because of all the supply chain disruption, just getting, securing inventory was the real challenge. And then 2020, 2022, the challenge is getting inventory off the shelves and convincing people to, you know, upgrade their TV or whatever. Um, and I'd say that the, the challenge with, 2021 was a lot of brands were having to make decisions about which retailer do we do we share inventory with um, and it was it was there was a scarcity of supply and choosing between your retail customers was challenging and and there is a lot going on behind the scenes in terms of vendor agreements with those retail customers what what ended up happening a lot of the times particularly for those companies that don't have uh really high executive buy-in for the amazon channel is that amazon was sort of bottom of the pile in terms of actually getting inventory and the reason why that's um that's a challenge is not just because you're out of stock for that period of time that there's no inventory but because of knock-on effects with uh organic search um, rankings and paid 
um, campaign performance as well. So there's, there's been some really great research into out of the effect of out of stocks on um, bestseller ranks and how that can have a bit of a halo effect over time. So you're not just out of stock and unavailable for that period of time. You actually suffer when you come back in stock because Amazon sort of, um, you know, penalizes your bestseller rank or how, how you show up in search for, for those terms later on. And with advertising, just turning that campaign on again is not, uh, you're not going to get back to that same level of spend or ROI right away. Um, and the, the second piece to add to that is while you're out of stock, it's not just sales on Amazon that might be affected there. In a lot of categories, I'm sure everyone dialing in has done this at least on occasion when you're in store, you're checking out Amazon product descriptions, features and reviews to supplement your in-store sort of consideration process. So I might be in Best Buy comparing two TVs. I want to see what people have, have said in Amazon product reviews about these two TVs. If I search for one and it's not in stock on Amazon, it's not going to show in search and I'm not going to be able to then compare it in the store. So that's one thing where we're starting to see a lot more, and this has been happening for a long time, but we're seeing a lot more interplay between channels and Amazon really is one of those channels where customers are using it as a, um, as a consideration tool. Yeah, and I think um, there's, it's like, I, I sort of think of the three main areas where brands can carve out a competitive advantage, supply chain, when it comes to digital commerce and Amazon in particular, supply chain is right up there with retail media and increasingly analytics and what Amazon's doing there. So um, like executive buying, it's hard to overstate the importance of just being really, really strong from a supply chain perspective. And again, you know, like I said, I think the results are encouraging. Three quarters of nearly three quarters of brands are, mm. you know, I, in, indicate that, that that they have done that. And, and that's come a long way. We don't have time series data, but just anecdotally, you know, mm. if you look back a few years pre-pandemic, um, th that, that figure has come a long way. Yeah, definitely. I th yeah, the pandemic certainly spurred a lot of action there. So we'll move on to the final factor. And if, if you are uh, attending live and you've got some questions for us, please feel free to pop them in the the audience Q and A, and we'll we'll get to those. The final factor here is a test and learn mindset, and so this was you know, relatively speaking when we look at the performance differential between brands doing test and learn versus not. It's not as as huge a um, upside as we've seen in some of the other factors, but I really think that there's there's probably more of a performance. Uh, differential that compounds over time with this. So the question here is, is your company willing to test and try new approaches, new ad types, new beta programs, new um, content opportunities on Amazon? And so the brands that, um, that always or, you know, often um, participated in those programs saw a, uh, a higher uh, growth, growth rate than those who only sometimes um, participated in those programs. And there's some separate data here that I've shared from PackView, which is just from an advertising standpoint, advertisers that adopt new ad types within the first three months typically see 8% greater total sales than those who don't. So that's uh, sort of supports that point of view. So we'll, I will say that there is a, uh, there's a graveyard of Amazon programs and initiatives that never go anywhere. And uh, you're certainly not guaranteed a home run with every, every um, program that is launched by Amazon. But there is definitely an early mover advantage to a lot of these programs and um, often, often um, programs and features are roll, rolled out 
free initially and then they end up costing money. So if you can get on board and get that early mover advantage, um, that might put you a good few months ahead of your competitors and ahead of the the, uh, mass adoption of that feature and give you uh, a little bit more of an advantage. So some examples here, live streaming, something that's very, very new is A++ premium content, which, you know, is a, is kind of a, these two are kind of perfect examples. They take a little bit of extra work. They take more assets. They take more headspace. Um, they take time to deploy, but uh, certainly with premium content, um, there's been some good, um, good uh, research into how premium content does improve conversion rates on Amazon. So some of these have definitely been proven the uh, the investment. So in 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 blue on this slide, um, what I've noted here is this very broad just starting point of um, bud budgeting considerations here, allocating 10% of your budget to new test and learn initiatives. So that could be a, a smaller or larger figure for your company, but I think it really is important to carve that out and get that budget secured so that you can um, use it for new things that come up and uh, have that be a standing priority in the budget. Yeah, if you just go back to that that last slide, Kiri, yeah. know, just one, you know, just a comment on this. You know, I think of Amazon and just how dynamic it is. It rolls out these different ad units or programs or, you know, whatever it may be. And usually they're not fully built out, right? They roll them out and then they iterate, yep. you know, they learn from it and they iterate. And that's really the opportunity. Again, I keep talking about sort of like a competitive edge. If you're early, again, that and, and it and it works, that competitive edge isn't going to be there forever, but it mm. can be a couple of months and it can even be a couple of years, um, depending on what it is. And so it's really a feature, not a bug as a part of the, working on the Amazon account is what is our process for test and learn, knowing that this is really kind of how we're going to differentiate ourselves from the competition on the site. Are we able to participate in these new tools and programs? Do we have the budget processes to allow for that? Have we thought about that from a planning perspective and so on? So I think it's just a really critical sort of skill to excel on Amazon. And then the next slide mm -hmm. um, relates to test and learn. And <clears throat> one of the findings in the report that I found really interesting is just this link between executive buy-in on Amazon's importance correlated to the company's general culture around testing new ideas. And so the percentage here shows the firms that say their company is consistently willing to test new ideas cut by how they view Amazon. So for example, 78% of firms we benchmarked that said all or nearly all of their executives agree Amazon's a critical channel also indicate their company is testing new ideas all the time. In contrast, just 2% of firms that said their company has a culture of test and learn don't take Amazon very seriously. It's not a priority. Mm -hmm. So in other words, your executive team's buy-in on the importance of Amazon is often an indicator of their general ability to see around the corner and their appetite for risk-taking on emerging models. So if your company was early to Amazon, it'll likely be early to the next big model that emerges or vice versa. And so mm -hmm. if you think back to the, the, that earlier slide I showed on how di different Amazon is, well, you know, there's a lot of new models being tested all the time on Amazon and off Amazon. Things like um, live streaming in the US or testing shoppable TV ads or streaming platforms or testing TikTok commerce or new delivery models, even new ways of thinking about Amazon's role in your D2C business. These are all new. They're all very tiny little drops in the retail bucket and they seem generally unlikely to take off. Um, but, but so did Amazon's core retail business at one point. And so mm -hmm. firms, you know, some firms are going to be there testing and learning typically the ones that were early to Amazon while, while others are going to lag and, you know, wait to see what, it, what, what develops. And it's just, it's really tough. I think inside of a big organization to change 
that test and learn mindset and test and learn culture, especially if you're not in the C-suite, but if you're in one of those firms that, you know, is, does have that, you know, strong risk appetite and is willing to move early, that can make working in e-commerce really exciting. Yep. That, that's a, that's a really great point. I want to, uh, I, I did see a question come through from Jim specifically about, um, premium A plus content being provided for free to seller central sellers. And do we anticipate that being rolled out to vendor central partners? Um, because it is very expensive on the, on the vendor central side. So I can't say whether the, that will be the price will come down on that, but I, I will observe an overall trend, which I'm interested to get your POV on as well, Russ, which is once upon a time, all of the great marketing and advertising features were on Vendor Central. And we saw a lot of brands trying to get onto the, the program once uh, available called Vendor Express so that they could get access to AMS, for example. Um, but the tide, I would say, circa 2018, really started to shift toward all of the great new features and more data being available to sellers rather than vendors. Um, and it is really kind of um, uh, sad, I guess, to see vendors being bottom of the of the pile in terms of features being rolled out and, and uh, data being made available to them. Um, so I, I wouldn't be, unfortunately, I wouldn't be surprised if it if it's not made available to vendors for free for a, a little while longer, just a part of a bigger trend that I'm seeing with features, marketing features between sellers and vendors. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it's kind of the, I don't know, I feel like the, it sort of ebbs and flows between the, the tools and different functionality between vendor and seller. Um, and ultimately there's sort of like a, leveling of the playing field, but, 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 but it can take some time to level on certain features, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, um, so I don't know the answer to that specific yeah. question, but that would be my sort of thought on, on where it goes from here. So just to, to, to close this out, and it certainly relates to test and learn, but it does also relate to the overall theme of the presentation today is if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. And this, what Amazon demands from organizations today is different to the business models of the past. And like Russ shared right at the beginning of the presentation, Amazon has been, is, is a different beast. It's required different things from companies. It requires a different way of thinking. Um, and so that's certainly what was borne out in our research here um, benchmarking how brands are uh, performing differently when they have different levels of internal engagement um, with the channel. Yep. So, so we covered a lot of ground. Where do we go from here? On the next slide, we have sort of like a, a three-step process. So a lot of my newsletters, I end with a section of discussion questions. And it's really just an acknowledgement that every company is going to be different. All of you on the call, you have unique constraints, you compete in different categories, you're at various points along the continuum of digital maturity and so on. And, and thus it, it's very difficult to offer blanket prescriptions, but what we can do is help create some discussion questions that are applicable to everyone. So what we recommend from here is to download the full report uh, we covered a lot of the findings in this session, but you'll have all of the data available within that report. Um, then take the self-assessment to see what areas you specifically lead or lag on, like what are the areas that you need to work on? And that'll give you just a good, you know, company specific foundation um, to then uh, use that custom data to start a discussion internally. So, you know, think about some of the things we discussed today. Is the mission clear? Do the metrics align with that mission on Amazon? How do we, you know, how do we help the executive team fully support our efforts on Amazon? You know, sometimes we sort of like, you know, there's a tendency to like blame the executives, but, you know, a lot of that responsibility comes back onto the e-commerce team and say, well, you know, clearly we haven't made the business case yet clear enough for for them to understand the opportunity so how can we help them 
uh, do that? Uh, what can we do differently supply chain wise? And importantly, like what are the innovative test and learn experiment experiments that we're running today? And if they're, you know, if you sort of like scratch your head at that, that, that question, then at least you're conscious of it and, and you can start, you know, putting more of a, a focus and an effort around it. Yeah. So we do have, again, big fan of QR codes on, on webinars. You can take a, uh, grab out your camera and, uh, get the link to the full PDF report, which, as I mentioned, there's a lot of content and a lot of data that we didn't get a chance to discuss today. We covered it at a pretty high level, but the full PDF report, definitely worth a read, more data in there, more commentary from Ross and myself on um, that contextualizes that. Um, also, Russ's Stratably newsletter, I'm a big fan. There's multiple editions each week. Always gives me a really great high-level snapshot of what's going on in the industry. Lots of Amazon news, uh, really astute take. So there's a, a free 60-day trial that you can participate in through that, um, through that QR code there or by using the coupon code e-commerce. Thanks for that, Russ. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And you also mentioned um, the uh, the self assessment, which I'm trying to pull up the QR code for now, but uh, I'm not able to do that. Mm -mm -mm. Nope. I will put it in the. It'll be in the replay, and it will be on that full PDF report landing page there as well. But that is that's it for today. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I apologize again for the hiccups with the link and the, uh, the spam is on the page to redirect people to other events and things like that. Um, thank you for showing up and participating today. I hope that this is uh, giving you some good, uh, adding to your toolkit for discussion within your company about Amazon and how to be successful there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. And thanks for everyone for joining. Really appreciate it.